Power 105.1 New York Hip Hop and R&B. My brother is in the building today. Shaka Sango, all New York Times best-selling <laughs> author. What's up, sis? How are you? Hi, Shaka. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. It's I, been so long. It's it, crazy. It's been a long time. Yeah. I feel like the last time you were here, it wasn't the last book. It was in between books you came. Yeah, or something. we were here for a, 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 a program I was producing with Oprah called Released. I love and the way you just... You know, gotta, gotta, gotta. You gotta, should gotta, say that gotta, all gotta the time. Gotta put the queen up in that there. That was when I was here with Oprah. <laughs> I was working on something with Oprah. <laughs> gotta put that up in there. I want to reset because I think you and I have had a couple of interviews. Some of my yeah. like, I love our, I love our talks. I Absolutely. love, I love when you are here. Yeah. Uh, I always, I feel like I feel you. I learn something from you. There's always like, I think I read the book and I know everything, <laughs> and then you share something. And yeah. it, I don't know. We just had a couple of great conversations. But in case you are new to Shaka's world, he has a new book out. It's called. Uh, Letters to the Sons of Society. Uh, and so we're going to talk about this book and why you should read it, why everybody should read it, and who should read it. And yeah. um, But our history is actually mentioned in the book briefly, yes, which yes. I feel so honored to even be mentioned <laughs> in the book. For, no. Number one, because I, I love your writing. Yeah. And number two, because I know Oprah is going to read this book. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> she actually read it already. She I just did. talked to her the other day. <laughs> She loved it, which is she a great. Did? Oh my how does God. that go, Shaq? What happens? Tell me how that process goes. So actually, I did an early reading, and Gail was at the reading. And I gave her a book. I'm like, "Can you get this to Oprah?" And she gave it to her, and Oprah literally sent me a message that night. It was like, "These letters are so beautiful." So the book is all. It's a, it's a series of letters to both yeah. of my sons, and then we ended up doing a conversation, and she really just walked through like why the letters are so impactful and why they inspire her to be in conversation with me. Uh, but just chap- it's, there's a chapter that I wrote that's really a pivotal moment in my life, and it was a big moment. It was you know going to the White House mm-hmm. after getting out of prison after all these years, and I was on the outside when all these things was happening, and you were the first person I encountered when I got in, and so I write about that experience of getting ready to meet President Obama, and then I didn't meet him, and it was about two years later that I actually met him, so... Yeah, I get a chance to talk about all that. I was telling my assistant, Brittany, in the car, because I was saying how we knew each other. Yeah. So we were at the White House. is when I went to see Obama. So And Van got emotional about mm-hmm. this amazing person that was doing such great work in criminal justice reform, and he mm-hmm. couldn't get in because of his... Co- felony. Because of his felony. Yeah. So he was literally outside of the White House, couldn't get in. Yeah. And while Van is talking about it, he's getting emotional and choked yeah. up and watery-eyed. And I was so touched by, like... Because, you know, men... You know... You know, he had been so uh, stoic through the whole mm, interview and him, yeah. watching him get emotional over what how you were being treated. Yeah. It touched me. You know what I mean? I was yeah. I was touched by that. So then we're in line getting ready to meet Obama. <laughs> Finally, you got in, but I didn't yeah. know who you were. We'd yeah. never met. Yeah. Shock is standing behind me in the line, and we just... You and I, we were yeah. like getting ready to meet Obama. We are yeah. like, hey, how you doing? I'm great. How you doing? We're, like, <laughs> right, we're just making right. small talk on the yeah. line. And then you said... So what was the best part of the, I yeah. missed it, so what was the best part? I was like, man, this part when Van talked about his, this this guy who's doing yeah. this great work in criminal justice, he couldn't get in, and you didn't stop me. <laughs> you let me keep going about yeah, this Yeah, I need moment. all the details. Yeah, you were just like looking at me, and then, yeah. and then at, we're just standing there. He goes, yeah, that was, so that was, that was me he was yeah. talking about. I was like, what? It was yeah. such a, it's such a great way to meet somebody. That's yeah. how we met. That I mean, was like our yeah. first. And we've been vibing and rocking and ever, been since, rocking ever and since. And it's really been, been yeah. truly a real connection as friends and yeah, as for family, sure. you know. And what's really interesting about what you said, though, is like this is what that book speaks to is this emotional vulnerability that we just don't talk about when it comes to men and specifically black men. Yeah. And, you know, whenever there's moments where we're emotive, it's typically as a result of loss. Mm. So, you know, you think about when our icons are killed or you think about when somebody we love dies, you know, it seems like that's the only time where our tears are allowed, but it can't be in these more complex moments, you know, moments of joy, moments of frustration at a system that would keep a man outside the White House who's doing all this work to change the system. And so that emotional vulnerability really comes through in the book, and it, that's why it was so important to have that story in there. And that was a historical moment for me, like to meet the 45th pre- president, you know? Uh-huh. Uh, and I actually didn't meet him that day because right as we was getting there, he got whisked away, you know? You didn't uh-huh. make it in, because I made it in. No, I know, you was, I, I think was you was the, the last cut. <laughs> I got the last photo? That's crazy. Yeah, I didn't make the cut. And, I should have so, dragged you in. With, we should have yeah, went in together, Sean. I know, right? That would have been... But I ended up yeah. meeting him a couple of years later, and I it bet. was all love, you know? And so I actually ended up meeting him on two different occasions, which was, you know, bananas when you think about it. And given where I had came from and what he represented, 
at the time, you know, I mean, he was going through his first election. I was going through my first parole board hearing. So there was all these intersections of me reading his book while I'm hoping to get out of prison. And they're giving me hope like this guy was so audacious and I'm not even like a political cat like I, I yeah, you know, yeah. I'm Lydia I'm like, like you just trying to save your thing. life you're trying to get your yeah. life back yeah but he is inspiring just to know that he dared to do something that nobody thought possible yeah and so I had to include that story in the book and so this is one of many beautiful stories of like emotional vulnerability connectivity and being as- aspirational in how I see life yeah so the, the, it's all letters Yeah. to your two sons. My two sons. One, I mean, two very different relationships. One you've you've been able to raise yeah. post-prison, and, yeah. and one you've had a lot of disconnect with, right? Because, Absolutely. Because he was raised while you were inside. W- yeah. w- were you able to, and I'm sure we've talked about this, but just for clarity, w- were you guys able to connect while you, like was he able to visit you? Did he know you? Were there letters? Yeah, so so the so the thing that inspired this this you know this book was one, I think the narrative about black males and black boys is completely skewed toward this idea that we have to change the narrative. And I don't think that's true. I think we have to expand it. And I think we have to be more inclusive of all aspects of who we are. And the thing that really excites me is that my dad used to write me while I was in prison. Mm -hmm. For 19, he would write these beautiful long letters handwritten. Uh, and actually, the cover is my dad's handwriting, handwritten letters from when I was so in prison. So he's a writer, prison. too. So this is where you get, this is where you get. Yeah. This from. So it just came very natural for him to communicate, and we were able to grow. We were able to heal a lot of the brokenness in our relationship. And my dad was very emotionally vulnerable in those letters. You know, he talked about the times when he felt. He talked about things he wished he could have done different. He talked about like his dream for me and how heartbreaking it was for me to be incarcerated. And him having to step up and raise my older son, Jay, uh, who I write about, you know, who I'm writing these letters to. So my older son is 30 years old. Wow. And my dad would bring him on visits, you know, prisons I was at all over the Michigan. Uh, he would sit him down and make sure that he wrote me letters. I wrote him letters. And we talked on the phone. But what happened was I created a narrative about who I was as his dad that turned out to not be true. And the narrative I had created was like, you know, we got the visits, we got the letters, you know, I'm parenting from prison. I'm telling him, hey, don't do this and don't do that. And here's my mistakes. And, you know, there's not enough letters that can fill in those gaps when you're absent for 19 years. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just not possible. Like, the number of visits I got just wouldn't amount to what it's like to spend a day as a dad when you're present. Mm -hmm. And so what I, you know, a lot of what I'm doing in in this book is really addressing that because there's so many of us that through a various means get taken out of our sons and our daughters lives and we don't think about the other side of that of what it's like for a child to have to navigate the world without their parent present or not knowing when their parent will be present Mm -hmm. and I really wanted to speak to that in an honest way and it was hard you know it's like you know I have an incredible relationship with my youngest son I mean I, I know I'm like a dope dad like I don't I don't even make any apologies about that I know how dope of a father I am how present how emotionally available I am but also know that I deprived my oldest son of that mm-hmm. and it was one of the most heartbreaking things to have to reconcile but I think it's important to lead in that way that allow other men to open up about the ways that they feel Has there, have you been is there hope in healing that I mean I know you can't mm-hmm. change it you can't Mag- put a magic wand and, yeah. and things could have been different, but is there, I don't know, Have do you f- have peace in that? Like, does he have peace in it? Or have you been yeah. able to, like, just kind of, does this help? Do the letters help? I don't know yet. He uh, doesn't want to read it. Really? Um, and, and I'm okay with that. You know, I've made peace with where I'm at and, you know, my role as his father at this point. Like, we're cool. He hits me up. I hit him up. Um, sometimes he wants to talk, sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes we just sit on the phone in silence. And I think that's where the love exists, is in those moments where you can be present with no ego attached. Um, you know, as a dad, I try to do what's considered egoless parenting, where I don't think about, you know, outcomes for my children at this point in their lives based on what I want for them. Like, they have to navigate the world. Yeah, and you know? he's 30. He's a man. Yeah, he's, a he's, mu- he's a man. He's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's a young man, and my young son is a little boy navigating the world. And so, you know, I've always always hoped for healing. Like, that was my biggest dream coming home was, like, to have this beautiful relationship with my son. You know, he was 19 when I came home, 
And, you know, I was mentoring all these young guys in prison. And so I'm like, oh, I can't wait to come home and put my son up on game and we're going to ride off to the sunset and we're going to do all these things. But I never asked him, did he want to sign up for that? Mm -hmm. And so it created this tension that I had to own and I had to be, you know, responsible for. I came home as a mentor and not as a father. Mm. And so I've grown and evolved to understand now holding space, you know, and that space is silent. It's all good because that's, that's what he needs. I just have to be present. So that's where I'm at with it. Oh, I know the letters are good. Yeah. <laughs> I know the yeah. letters are good. That's one of the things, it's the first things you learn, like when I was dipping my toe and learning about criminal justice reform and what needed to happen and what were the, you know, the repercussions of the mm -hmm. system that we have now. And it's aside from the individual that is living, you know, there's so many people in prison right now that shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, aside from them is the family, right? Absolutely. It's This is the big... This is the, this is the big discussion about how it affects the family and the kids and the sons that are being raised with their father inside. And yeah. um, are you hopeful about? Because you've been doing a lot of work in this space. Like, how? Give me an update. Give, <laughs> that's a, yeah. that's a big question. I know, yeah. but like, man, sometimes I feel hopeful when I see some of the work being done, yeah. and sometimes I feel like shit. Is it's a lot. are we gonna get a budge? Can we get? Yeah. I mean, how where where are we in that space? I mean, I, I think we've done collectively, we've done tremendous work okay. over the years. I mean, the fact that we can even have conversations about criminal justice and and, and it's normal now. It's yeah, not yeah, like it a, a normal weird problem. thing, yeah. right? So I think we're 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 getting some traction. We got a long way to go. And what I've always tried to really focus on in my work is the human side of it. You know, when I think about my dad. Like, my dad took on the responsibility of having another child when he was in his 40s. And this is my responsibility I left. Mm. And it wasn't until I got a little bit older and I would go back and read his letters, and he was talking about the things that he were he was doing, you know, to make sure my oldest son had all the things he, he needed. And, I mean, this was recent when I was reading those letters, and I was like, wow, I missed all that. Mm -hmm. You know, because I was in the midst of, like, surviving prison and doing all the things and I'm like, man, this man gave up all of, you know, the years that he was done raising kids, you know, that he was ready to go off and enjoy life with his wife, and now they had another child to raise, you know, and that's the consequence of some of the decisions we make. And I'm really, you know, adamant about talking about that part, because a lot of times we talk about the system, we don't talk about personal responsibility and accountability of, for the things that we've actually, you know, contributed to our family's hurt. Yeah. No, I get that. Who do you, when you, when you do, I know obviously the letters are to your son, but when you make a book like this, who is it, who are you making it for? Yeah. So the book started off as a series of letters. The idea started off mm -hmm. as a series of letters based on my mentoring work, you know, so I get a chance to work with young men and women all across the country, you know, from high schools, colleges, entertainment, you know, every, everything you could think of, you know, so I was like, you know, looking at what's going on with the story of black men. Like, we're America's problem, we're black women's problem, we're each other's problem, and we're nobody's solution. And I know that that's not true. Mm -hmm. And I know that that narrative was nonsense, and I was like, I need to speak to the heart and soul of these young brothers so they'll know that even though all these external things are being said, that there is truth that's right around you, you know? So I started off like, letters to my hip hop sons, and letters to my entrepreneurial sons. And as I was thinking about the idea, I was like, you know, I have two sons that embody all of these sons. Between those two worlds of my 30-year-old son and my 10-year-old, it's every son I've ever mentored. You know, the hopes and dreams and aspirations, the letdowns, the fallouts, the disconnects, they exist between my two sons. And I felt like if I connected to my sons, that it would resonate with all sons. Mm. And anybody, like, who cares about fathers and, and, and it's, you know, I write to my son, that's what I have, right? Um, <laughs> but I promise you, like, the themes in this book are so resonant with people from every aspect you can think of. Accountability is a big thing, huh? Absolutely. Yeah, I get that yeah. from you. Yeah. I, 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 I always feel like there's something in, in each of your stories. And I do su suggest, by the way, first of all, everybody should get this book. Um, mm -hmm. But some of the past interviews, and, and if you don't know Shaka's story, digging kind of into mm -hmm. that because it is so inspirational. Just, mm -hmm. you know, your experiences, what you've been through, how you've come out of it, and then what you're doing with your life to change other people's lives. Yeah. is. It's so inspirational always, man. So yeah. 
Yeah. Salute on that. And you're getting like nice. I saw Nas posted the other day, yeah. which I thought was dope. I That's think he crazy. called you like his favorite writer too. Yeah. I mean, he invited me to to write a piece for King's Disease too, and I was able to do that, which was like mm-hmm. the most surreal thing. You have like. How did that even happen? So crazy thing. Sure, I'm trying to give you a short summary of it. Right. 1994. I'm on like my third year in prison. I get Illmatic. I'm listening to it. I hear One Love, and I literally jump off my bunk like, yo, he's writing a letter to somebody incarcerated. Somebody out here feels us. I go and get a tattoo of Illmatic on my arm. You still have it? I do. It's the worst tattoo ever, I promise you. (laughs) And now you got to think this early 94, they not even sophisticated with tats in there. So a guy literally is just like hammering Illmatic into my arm. And then for some reason I was like, we should put a dog on there with a chain. And so it literally, it's, it's the worst tattoo ever. <laughs> I, I literally tell my friend, I got a, a dope friend, uh, my, my guy Ben. So Ben Horowitz is my guy. Uh, I'm telling him this story. Ben Horowitz is a big deal, by the way. Yeah, that's this, this is my bro, right? So I tell Ben the story, show him the tattoo. He falls out of his chair laughing. He like, yo, I gotta call Nas. He calls Nas. I tell Nas the story of how his album inspired me. Fast forward, we meet. First meeting, it was kind of like the what up, what up, you know? Yeah, nah. Brother things, how we yeah, roll, yeah, you know? Yeah. And Nas, super chill. Yeah. Running to each other again, kind of, you know, what up, what up, a little bit more cooler. And then we ended up hanging out one day. You know, me, him, and Ben, we spent probably about six hours just listening to Eric B and Rakim, Boogie Down Production. That's a great day. And the best thing about it is Nas is genuinely a fan of hip hop. For sure. It is so genuine. And you just see. So at that point, it's just like we three teenagers, you know, having the time of our life. Fast forward, he hits me up. He's like, yo, I want you to write something for this song. Uh, he was like, don't rap. Just <laughs> write something for the song, right? I'm like, cool. I'm like, okay, when you need it. He was like, I'm actually in the studio now. Can you send it over? So I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm texting all calm. Like, okay, yeah, I got you. <laughs> I put the phone down. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. What do you mean? Like right now, right? And I ended up writing this piece uh, for the song Composer, mm-hmm. uh, which is on King's Disease 2. And elements of that piece ended up being in the book because I thought the words were so resonant about how do you hold it together when everything around you is falling apart? How do you lean into our ancestors and their experiences? Do you get yeah. music publishing on that? I do. Come on, you know I got to nah. be about the business. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and the dope thing is like you know Nas was that. intentional about making sure. Nah, you know, he's the good like that. Uh, I wanted yeah. to pull up the because uh, I love what he wrote about. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Letters to the Sons of Society. My bro Shaka dropped this new book today. One of my favorite authors in today's world. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm always sending him like. Things I've written, you know, just because we be, we be vibing, like, really about all the things, you know, about being a man, being a leader, you know, being a dad, and, and you know, he's just really a genuine brother. And Hit Boy as well, who produced the track, is yeah. super dope. They're like, these guys just show up as authentic, real brothers, and I just have tons of respect for them. That's and they dope. inspire me as well. I know you're a hip-hop fan, too. What do you think of... And- what do you think about what's happening, what Jay and Mika are doing in, in reform in terms of, um, you know, they're trying to make it so that the lyrics can't be used. Yeah, do you know Pluto. anything? Yeah. Do you yeah. know anything about that process? Or I mean, I, you know, I definitely know, understand what they're getting to is where, you know, if you go to court for, if you get charged with something, right, mm-hmm. nobody can come into court and be like, well, yeah, he actually, yesterday he did that. It's like hearsay. And you're basically using something to skew the case in a way that favors the prosecutor. So I think when, you know, some, if somebody's accused of a violent crime and they've happened to have written something that was violent lyrics, you know, they have taken that stuff and they're weaponizing that in the courtroom in a way that's unfair because in the world of music and entertainment, you know, it's, it's entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like if, you know, one of the filmmakers get in trouble, they're going to be like, you know, and 10 years ago he made this film where it's murder and mayhem, therefore he's guilty. Uh, so I think it's a little more complex than what people think. Mm. Uh, but I think it's a great way to tell the system on how they railroad so many people in the prison and how this particular genre has been targeted in the ways we just don't see with other uh, genres of music. Yeah. I like to see celebrities using their platform for this, too. Mm. People give, um, you know, Kim, Kim Kardashian's been doing a lot of work in this Kim space. Kim a beast. She is, right? No, it's like whatever beast. you think about her, for whatever other reason, you can't just... I don't know how you discredit. Kim is a real one. Like, I'm not talking about just, like, Kim used to come to our office and really sit and build with our members when I was executive director of Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Always showed up at the Senate when we needed her. Always shows up to get help get people out 
who really deserve their freedom. Like she's genuine and she actually does the work. Uh, she studied with two friends of mine, uh, Jessica Jackson and Aaron Haney, who actually helped her with her legal. And what a lot of people don't think about, it's like her dad is a lawyer, was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And just because you become a celebrity or become successful, doesn't mean you stop revering your parents. Like that connectivity, all of, you know, most people who have a healthy relationship with their parent, always gonna look up to them, no matter where levels of success we achieve, mm -hmm. our parents is always gonna be that barometer of approval. And so her work in this space is legit. And she's, like I say, she real. It's a lot of people talk about it, they don't do the work. What do you, you mean, though? I mean? Like, what? Like, what? Like, is there something that she's doing that most people don't do? I mean, she actually puts it on the line. She goes to the Senate. She talks to, you know, senators. She's talking to lawyers. Mm -hmm. She actually spends time with system-impacted people. She comes to our office with no frills, bells, and whistles and really seeks to learn and understand. There's a lot of people who will post a tweet or slap their name on something that they got approved to slap their name on. And it's not the real work, but it matters. Like I'm not—I don't want to discredit. Right, right. It's absolutely, absolutely helpful. But it's levels to it. You know, it's like with anything, it's levels to it. Mm. And she's at that level where you know I can never question her intent because I've seen it in action. Wow, that's yeah. nice to hear, man. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people doing good work in this. Oh, it's incredible people, Van. You know, Scott Budnick. You know, this is an incredible organization that's really leading and people putting it on the line. Yeah. So. And yeah. you, and you, my friend. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> All right, let's let's uh, just let's give a hard sell on why everybody should get this book, Shot. Yo, first of all, this book is so poetically beautiful. It's well written. It's super vulnerable, very emotional, um, and I believe that it offers us the greatest pathway to understanding how to parent in a way that includes all of our emotions, all of our experiences as dads, and that expands the narrative as opposed to change the narrative. Well, congratulations. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be another bestseller. Let's go. Let's go. Shaka Sango, everybody. Five one five point one.